While various principals have various methods of running their schools, nobody is better acquainted with this fact than our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School. Now, you take her principal, Osgood Conklin. And I wish you would. <laughs> Mr. Conklin has always been a great believer in meetings. These invariably occur early in the morning before first class. This is to ensure that everyone will be as brisk and chipper as a damp pen wiper. <laughs> Our most recent meeting took place in his office last Friday morning. Present were Mr. Conklin's daughter, Harriet, president of the student body, Mr. Boynton and myself as faculty advisors, and Walter Denton, editor of the Madison Monitor. <clears throat> this meeting is now called to order. As in the past, parliamentary procedure will prevail. How extremely alliterative. Parliamentary procedure will prevail. Silence. <laughs> if you wish to speak, kindly raise your hand. As the chair recognizes Walter Denton. The Walter Denton says, thank you, chair. <laughs> All I wanted to know was, why did we have to get here so early? Couldn't we have held this meeting later? Quiet. The chair recognizes its lack of judgment in recognizing Walter Denton. <laughs> However, the reason for this meeting can be told in two words. The first one is excessive. And the second? Please, Walter, don't interrupt. That's right, Walter. Just listen. Come on, Mr. Conklin. Drop the other word. <laughs> the other word is noise. Noise? Excessive noise? That's why we're here? Because of excessive noise? This is beginning to sound like choir practice. <laughs> What kind of noise do you mean, Daddy? I mean the noises that penetrate this office while I am trying to work. You mean when the students are changing classes? Yeah, and they make sounds like shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Hey, Charlie, want to play hairball after school? <laughs> I know, Fred. Old Lady Nelson might keep me in. I'll be able to tell you during lunch period. Okay, Charlie, see you in the cafeteria. <laughs> hey, Fred, I bring my lunch. I can't eat that slop in the cafeteria. <laughs> well, then how will I be able to... Oh, shut I... up! <laughs> I... I mean, the chair sees no cause for such graphic description. Nor is this specifically the excessive noise to which we have reference. Well, then, what is it, sir? Is it the street noises that penetrate your office while you're trying to work? The street noises? Like, Hong Kong, beep, beep. Get that heap out of my way, buster. Oh, way. quiet. <laughs> I, I called this meeting to secure some constructive suggestions, not to start a little theater movement. <laughs> now, stop acting and listen. During school hours, this institution is a veritable bedlam. You will now submit whatever ideas you may have toward mitigating this unhappy circumstance. Well, speaking for the sounds that emanate from the biology laboratory, Mr. Conklin, uh, perhaps the flames of the Bunsen burners are hissing too loud. <coughs> uh, I could turn those down a bit. Uh, then, too, I could cut down on the tinkle of the test tubes. Then, too, he could, uh, he could put socks on the mice in the treadmill. <laughs> As far as the corridors go, Daddy, you could ask all the students to whisper while they're changing rooms. And if they failed to comply, you might station monitors at strategic points to see that they did. Yeah, or better yet, just string a banner across the hall right outside your office. What would the banner say, Walter? It would just say, shh. That's worse than no noise at all. <laughs> It is quite apparent to me that now, as in the past, any feasible plan for combating a given crisis must stem from one source and one source alone. Well, that's nice of you to say so, Mr. Conklin. But... I refer to myself. <laughs> <laughs> However, before I disclose the cure, I will make known the nature of the ailment. There are only two human sources of irritation to me within the confines of this institution. They are A the student body, and B, the faculty. How about C, the janitor? <laughs> what is it we do that bothers you, Daddy? You talk. During classes, after classes, during lunch period, after lunch period. But, Mr. Conklin... And you on the faculty are equally guilty. Guilty? It isn't the volume of jabber that's so nerve-wracking to me. 
but the fact that all these conversations are directed to but one target. What target is that, Mr. Conklin? Each other. <laughs> I tried talking to a board eraser one morning, but everybody looked at me funny. <laughs> if we didn't talk to each other, we'd be talking to ourselves. And what kind of a looking school will we be then? Even you, Denton, should be able to comprehend the fact that when I say each other, I mean the male and female members of the student body and faculty. You know my anti-fraternization law? From now on, there will be teeth in it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, oh, you will, Boynton, you will. From now until further notice, I hereby decree that all members of the opposite sex shall refrain from any conversation not absolutely essential to school business. Boys and girls will sit on separate sides of the classroom, and during lunch period, male and female teachers, as well as students, will occupy two different sections of the cafeteria. <laughs> Jerry, that's positively medieval. It's worse than that. It's medieval tyranny. If I may borrow an expression from the undergraduate body, Denton, turn blue. <laughs> Just a minute, Mr. Conklin. May I say something to you? Uh, first, I'd like to say something to you. I wish you wouldn't. I don't look good in blue. <laughs> that is, speaking for the faculty, sir, I'm afraid this edict of yours will be met with considerable resentment. The temper of the faculty doesn't concern me in the slightest, Miss Brooks. Needless to say, stringent, punitive measures will be taken if anyone violates my order. Uh, but, but, sir, perhaps such stern measures won't be necessary. If you'll permit me to address the school assembly, I think I could get your point across by relating a humorous anecdote pertinent to the subject. A, uh, a humorous anecdote, Mr. Boynton? Yes, sir. <laughs> I told this story at a recent biology club meeting, and it was received with considerable enthusiasm by my fellow biologists. I bet they laughed so hard they dropped their frogs. <laughs> anyway, this story involves some extremely humorous characters, uh, their names are Timothy Sweeney, Patrick Clancy, and Seamus O'Houlihan. <laughs> you see, it's about three Irish fellows. Uh, it's going to be about a bank teller in Dutch Guiana. <laughs> Please, Miss Brooks, let Mr. Boynton finish. Uh, to be perfectly candid, when I discovered this anecdote in an old anthology of humor, it was couched in rather antiquated terms. However, by rephrasing it, I've brought it up to the minute. So, without further ado, here goes. <clears throat> One day, Sweeney, Clancy, and O'Houlihan were about to take a written examination preparatory to entering the police force. Now, see here, Bagara, O'Houlihan exclaimed with a merry twinkle in his Irish eye. I'm going to get the highest mark of anyone in the room. Now, what do you think of that? I don't know. What do you think of it? <laughs> I'm not finished, Miss Brooks. Oh. When Sweeney heard that, he looked at O'Houlihan and with a merry twinkle in his Irish eyes declared, Fiddle dee dee. Oh, that's Sweeney. <laughs> <laughs> then, then Clancy, with a merry twinkle in his Irish eyes, averred, Faith, and you'll get the lowest mark, beach avers. Well, sir, they had no sooner begun taking the test when, lo and behold, a mounted policeman's horse wandered in. With a merry twinkle in his Irish tail. <laughs> Please be quiet, Miss Brooks. Oh, let her talk. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt. Thank you. After O'Houlihan turned in his test paper, Clancy and Sweeney accosted him, somewhat chagrined. O'Houlihan, you cheated, cried Sweeney, brandishing his shillelagh. A uh, quaint cudgel indigenous to those lovable folks of the old sod. Then he said... We saw you peeking at the answers in the back of the book. Well, O'Houlihan retorted somewhat testily, I vowed I was going to get the highest mark of anyone in the room. Now I knew that fair and square, I could get a higher mark than you, Sweeney, and a higher mark than you too, Clancy, by the same honest means. But when that horse came in to take the test, I thought I'd better cheat. <laughs> Don't you get it? I don't particularly want it. <laughs> uh, 
Now, what has that anecdote got to do with the current situation? Oh, it's about cheating, Mr. Conklin. Someone violates your ban against conversation between the sexes. That's a form of cheating. A, a form of cheating? One of the duller forms, I'd say. <laughs> well, we've wasted enough time. Since there seems to be some doubt as to the efficacy of my plan, I shall put it to the acid test. What do you mean, Daddy? In accordance with my democratic principles, I shall put it to a vote at this meeting. All opposed to my plan will signify by saying no. 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 All in favor say aye. Aye. <laughs> the ayes have it. Motion carried. <laughs> What about our nose? Keep it out of my business. <laughs> aye, 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 sir. Friends, if you suffer from acid indigestion, I hope you didn't miss reading this wonderful news. A headline that says, New Mint, Medically Proven, Quickly Rid Stomach of Gastric Distress. That headline is talking about new Bicidol mints. Doctors recommend Bicidol mints because the Bicidol medication acts at once to make painful acid harmless and give you fast five-way relief. One, speeds relief from gas. Two, sweetens your breath. Three, gives complete longer-lasting relief than baking soda. Four, relieves stomach upset from too much eating, drinking, smoking. Five, lets you sleep when acid indigestion strikes at night. So don't suffer acid indigestion, heartburn, or gastric distress from excess acidity. Remember, new mints, medically proven, quickly rid stomach of gastric distress. And remember the name, Bicidol Mints, B-I-S-O-D-O-L. Get Bicidol Mints for fast relief. at lunchtime, one half of the school cafeteria was roped off for males and the other half for females. But despite this barrier, Walter Denton managed to slither past my table and surreptitiously slip me a cryptic note. The note directed me to report to an abandoned stockroom in the basement, and it also contained the secret password by which I could gain admittance. I was loath to take part in such sneaky maneuvers, so I didn't report to the appointed room until three minutes later. <laughs> What's the secret password? Mr. Conklin is a schnook. <laughs> Correct. Enter, friend. Well, what do you think of this old abandoned stockroom, Miss Brooks? I think we ought to abandon it. <laughs> it's pretty stuffy, Walter. Well, you should have seen it before I cleaned it up. This room is my answer to Mr. Conklin's ban against conversation between the sexes. It's a secret meeting place in which a few choice male and female teachers and students may conversationally rendezvous during lunch period. Well, what do you know? A talk legger. <laughs> <laughs> These are rather cramped quarters, Walter, but I must admit it's a good idea. Thanks. Now, about the rates. I charge 10 cents for the first five minutes. What? And five cents for each additional three minutes. Those are about the same rates you pay for a phone call. Yes, but the phone company provides a bigger booth. I'm sorry, Walter, but I'm not shelling out 10 cents just for some conversation. I also told Mr. Boynton about it. He'll be here any minute. Yeah, well, nevertheless, I don't intend... To... Here's my dime. Where do I sit? <laughs> you just park any place you like. I'll get it. What's the password? Mr. Conklin is a schnook. And her friend. <laughs> I cleaned her from top to bottom, Mr. Boynton. How does she look? Miss Brooks always looks neat to me. <laughs> what he meant, you Give Mr. me Bo ten cents and she's yours for five minutes. <laughs> what on earth would I do with Miss Brooks for five minutes? <laughs> Let's pay an extra half dollar and figure something out. <laughs> the ten cent fee is just for the use of the room, Mr. Boynton. Just for the room? Ten cents? Well, that's exorbitant, Walter. It's outrageous. It's unreasonable. It's... Uh, uh, Try uh, bejabers. <laughs> bejabers, it's too much. Well, those are my rates. 
it's only fair I get something for my labors, Mr. Boynton. This morning, this was just a musty old room loaded with dust, cobwebs, gophers. Gophers? They've left. They didn't like the rates either. <laughs> this is no time to economize, Mr. Boynton. Don't you think it's worth 10 cents to be able to sit around and chat with members of the opposite, you should excuse the expression, sex? <laughs> I suppose you're right, Miss Brooks. Do uh, you have two nickels for a dime? Yes, I have. Well, give them to Walter. I don't happen to have a dime on me. That's the quickest way I was ever beaten out of a dime. Walter, do you have ten pennies for two nickels? Yes, I have. Well, keep them. I don't have two nickels. <laughs> yeah, I'll put you on the cuff for today, Mr. Boynton. I'll go. What's the password? Mr. Conklin is a schnook, but he really isn't, Miss Brooks. Come in, Harriet. Oh, hello, Harriet. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Hi, Walter. Harriet, my beloved. All this gloomy morn, I have prayed for this magic-laden moment when you would come to me on the wings of love. That'll be ten cents, please. <laughs> ten cents? That's a nickel a wing. <laughs> That's the price we must pay for your father's folly, Harriet. Oh, please don't be too harsh on poor Daddy. The reason he's become so antagonistic toward fraternizing is because of Mother. Your mother? Yes, Miss Brooks. Mother isn't due back home until this afternoon. For the past week, she's been visiting Grandma in Montrose. And Daddy's missed her dreadfully. Why, it's become an obsession. Wherever he looks, he sees boys and girls together. Him and Mamie O'Rourke. <laughs> <laughs> Their conversing and having fun makes him all the more lonely. It's gotten so bad that he's going to stay after school and write an editorial for the Madison Monitor announcing his long-range anti-fraternization plans. Maybe we can nip that in the bud, Harriet. Mr. Boynton, Walter, while he's writing those editorials, I think we ought to drop over and see Mrs. Conklin. She's always been very fair-minded about these things, and I believe I have a rather brilliant idea. Excuse me. What's the password? I am a schnook. <laughs> oh, Mr. Conklin. Curiosity prompted me to read this unsigned, neatly typed note that I found in the cafeteria. Now then, will you open the door, Miss Brooks, or do your rules blackball schnooks over 40? <laughs> uh, not at all, sir. Come right in. Daddy! Mr. Conklin! Yipe! <laughs> so, we have the start of a nice little cell, haven't we? Oh, you don't understand, Mr. Conklin. We know nothing about any notes you may have found. We came here merely to do some spring cleaning. Spring cleaning? Yes, sir. We decided that this room must be cleaned out immediately when we discovered that its inhabitants were behaving in a shocking manner and in flagrant violation of your anti-fraternizing rule. Just what do you mean by that, Miss Brooks? The boy gophers were holding hands with the girl gophers. <laughs> well, with Mr. Conklin's rigid anti-fraternization rule, Madison High seemed like an occupied country under the heel of a conqueror's boot rather than the charming, pleasant little prison it had always been. <laughs> it was obvious something drastic would have to be done about the rule, and that night, with Mrs. Conklin's assistance, we set out to see if we could abolish it. I'll go lend a hand to Mrs. Conklin and Harriet in the kitchen, Miss Brooks. All right, Walter. And need any help setting the table, Mr. Boynton? I'm afraid I do. I'm not much good at this sort of thing. Would you give me a hand? Both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... You're doing fine, I think, but you ought to set those shakers at the far end of the table. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, excuse me, Miss Brooks, but you're standing in the way. Unless you move, I'll have to squeeze past you. I know. Get going. <laughs> it won't be such a tight squeeze, Mr. Boynton. Just try it for size. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll just get... You. <laughs> I'll never get through that way. <clears throat> now, maybe if I slant my shoulders, I can get through. Oh, Miss Brooks, I I'm stuck. 
So I was wrong. Kiss me. <laughs> there you go, joshing again. <laughs> well, I've got to admit it, Miss Brooks. You're as full of fun as Patty's pig. <laughs> I'm as Irish as a barrel of monkeys. <laughs> well, dinner's almost ready, Miss Brooks. Any sign of Osgood? Not yet, Mrs. Conklin. Apparently, he's still working on those editorials at school. Oh, such nonsense. Well, those ridiculous anti-fraternizing rules of his will be a thing of the past if your scheme works, Miss Brooks. And I'll do everything I can to see that it does. We certainly appreciate your cooperation. Uh, I'd better move those casserole dishes to the other side of Mr. Boynton. I'm busy mixing the salad, Miss Brooks. You'll... Have to walk around me. Sounds like a fascinating trip. <laughs> Mother, Daddy's car just pulled into the driveway. Yeah, and he's got a big bouquet of roses. Oh, dear Osgood, he has missed me, hasn't he? Oh, goodness, I, I mustn't get sentimental if your scheme's to work, Miss Brooks. We'll see how he likes the taste of his own medicine. Martha! Martha! You, my wandering lovebird! <laughs> your mate is home! <laughs> well, fly into the dining room, Osgood. Ah, uh, Martha, come into my arms. Please, my... no fraternization. What? <laughs> Miss Brooks, Boynton, Denton. Hi, Mr. Conklin. Long time no see. Be jabers. <laughs> uh, what is the unholy three doing here, Martha? <laughs> well, we had no place to go, so Mrs. Conklin invited us to dinner. You see, sir, Mr. Boynton's apartment's being painted today. And so is my house. Mine, too. Isn't that a coincidence? We made a deal with the same paint company. They only paint one day a week. On Friday. That's why they're called the Friday Paint Company. <laughs> I see. Martha, if you'll step into the den with me where we can be alone. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. ah. Sorry, Osgood. No fraternizing. Darling, what are you saying? I'm your husband. That's no excuse. Take off your hat, Osgood. Dinner's ready. But, lover girl, <laughs> I've missed you terribly. Look, look, I've brought you flowers. Dump them in the salad bowl. <laughs> I mean, get a vase, Walter. Now, let's have dinner before it gets cold, shall we? Uh, dinner, yeah. You sit down here, Martha. I'll the sit... seating arrangements are not up to you, Osgood. Since Miss Brooks has helped me to prepare this meal, I've asked her to take charge of serving it. She says she's learned some wonderful methods at Madison. Uh, take over, Miss Brooks. Thank you. You are to be seated at the head of the table, Mrs. Conklin. Harriet, you'll sit to her right, and I'll sit to her left. Mr. Conklin? Yes? You are to have dinner in the kitchen. <laughs> in the kitchen? With Mr. Boynton and Walter Denton. In this way, the males are separated from the females. Oh, but this is absurd. I, I haven't seen my wife in a week. This is the way you run things at school, Osgood, and you've got to practice what you preach. Now, into the kitchen with Walter and Mr. Boynton. But, sweetie pie... <laughs> Come on, Dad, we'll have a ball. <laughs> oh, no. It's a lovely full moon out tonight, Mr. Conklin. How did you enjoy it in the garden? Frankly, I found it rather unromantic sitting on the hammock between Boynton and Denton. <laughs> well, Miss Brooks and Harriet and I are having loads of fun playing bridge, Osgood. Oh, bridge? You need a fork? Sorry, no fraternization. If you'll escort Walter and Mr. Boynton to the den, sir, I've laid out a set of tiddlywinks for you. <laughs> tiddlywinks at my age? Uh, some tiddlies are older than others. <laughs> Martha, Martha, I haven't been alone with you for one minute during this entire evening. It's almost midnight. Well, so it is, Osgood. And it's time we turned in. High time. Let us retire to our bedroom, Martha. Good night, Miss Brooks, Miss Bunch. You Good... know their homes are being painted, Osgood. I've asked them to stay over with us. What? Uh, what are the sleeping arrangements to be, Miss Brooks? Well, there's only one feasible scheme. You'll sleep with Harriet and me in your bedroom, Mrs. Conklin. And you, Miss Conklin, will sleep in Harriet's bedroom with Mr. Boynton and Walter. 
Oh, I will. Well, it can't be rude, Osgood. It's an emergency. You mean I actually have to spend the night with Mr. Boynton and Denton? Not the night, Osgood. The entire weekend. The entire what end? <laughs> weak, weak, sir. The way you're beginning to feel about your plan at school. Oh, uh, Miss Brooks, you're right. Not only am I outnumbered, I've been outmaneuvered. <laughs> However, if I agree to cancel my ban on coeducational conversation at Madison, do you suppose you and your cohorts could find some place to billet yourselves? I'm sure we could, Mr. Conklin. We could all go home. Home? But, but what about the painters? Oh, haven't you heard? This Friday paint company went on strike this afternoon. On strike? Yes, it seems they want longer brushes and a shorter day. 